I want to take you to Genesis chapter 1, if you would, please. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, and as you look at verse 4, you see that it says, And God saw the light, that it was good, that it was good. Verse 10, at the end of verse 10, it says, And God saw that it was good. And again in verse 12, in verse 18, Verse 21, verse 25, it repeats that again and again. It was good. And if you look at verse 31, verse 31, it says, And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. Well, the theory of evolution would have us believe that it was not very good. Indeed that it was necessary for the weak to fall prey to the strong, that this struggle has to go on and on, and it will continue to go on and on. In fact, millions of years into the past, this has been going on. And who knows how many millions of years into the future, after humans have finished their meaningless existence, they say this will go on and on. Is that really how it is? <laughs> I'd like to see what this says, wouldn't you? Let's take a look. The theory of evolution suggests that for those millions of years, this cycle of death and life and life and death has been necessary for existence, really. That's not what I read. Not in Genesis 131 where it says that God saw everything that He had made and behold it was very good. It was very good. Hmm. Evidently death was not necessary then. How about that? In fact we read in Genesis 131, where it was so good at that last day that God said it is not just good, but very good. And we're told in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that there's a reason for death. For the wages of sin is death, yes. It was not because things were not good and we needed that. Sin caused death. Death then is not necessary for life to continue. That's not how this has to happen. Evolutionary theory contends that this has all continued for a long, long time, and in fact it's always been going on just like it is today, that it just always continues. Rocks are dated eons old because we know what the decay rate is on some certain particles and things, and that it's exactly the same all the time. I have a question for you then. I'm, I'm just wondering, on the sixth day when God created Adam, when he came from God's hand, did he go, wah, 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 because he was only this long? Or did God make a fully functioning, mature human being? So I suppose that when this earth was formed, it had to have been, you know, out of some chaos and slowly evolved. Or was God able to make a fully mature planet? <laughs> oh, yeah. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I know. It was the chicken. <laughs> God can make fully mature chickens. It's amazing. He's, he's just that talented. It's amazing what our God can do. Indeed, God even knew that people would be thinking this way. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 4 says, 
and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, here comes the evolutionary theory, are you ready? All things Peter told us ahead of time what people would be thinking. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Not only did God make a fully mature world that baffles men today, but he predicted that we would be baffled and we'd have no way to explain it except to say, oh, it's, it's always been this way. And God knew that. So the theory then of evolution also contends that bringing this earth to the state it has been in for the last few thousand years took millions of years. But that directly contradicts the Bible. Over and over in Genesis chapter 1, we see the words that tell us it's 24-hour days. Look at verse 5 in Genesis chapter 1 again. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Day, just like we know it today. With evening and morning, it comes and goes 24 hours every day. And the same in verse 8. At the end of verse 8, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And verse 13 tells us about the third day. Verse 19, the fourth day. And verse 23 and 21. We see again and again this evening and morning day and the seven-day weekly cycle are by God's doing. He told us then that at the end of that first weekly cycle, what happened? in Genesis chapter 2, at the beginning right there. What did he do? Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, verse 1, right? And all the host of them, how long did it take? Six days. Six evening and morning regular days. Verse 2, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested the seventh day from all his work which he had made. But watch what happens in verse 3. And God blessed, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Why did he do that? Why did God do that? Did he just figure, eh, we'll pick one day in seven. Doesn't matter. Is that what God was thinking? Instead, in the middle of verse 3, it picks up and says, because that in it he had rested from all the work which God created and made. And so the Sabbath is a memorial of creation from the very beginning. It wasn't just that Moses came up with this during the receiving of the Ten Commandments and he decided that we needed to keep one day in seven. This goes all the way back all the way back. I want to think with you just for a moment then. We've talked about here a few things and I want to think about it with you. Evolution says death is necessary for life. It's not what God said. He said it was very good without death. Evolutionary theory assumes that everything continues as it has. No, God called it into existence right from the start. Evolutionary theory says it took millions of years. God says, no, it was 24-hour days, just six of them. Some people try to harmonize these things. I want to think about where we are with this today. Where are we? with creation and evolution today? Where do we stand today? Some people try and harmonize these things, bring it together, you know? Well, maybe God just created over long periods of time. Really? 
Maybe, maybe we only heard this story because when, when the when the Hebrews came out of slavery, they were just too backward and too misunderstanding to really get how it was. And so God came up with this much simpler story to help them out. Is that what it was? Is that what it was? They were just too backwards? If so, then why did Moses, the man who wrote Genesis, right? Why did he in the, work, in the work of Job, in the book of Job, why did he write in Job chapter 26 verse 7, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. It took us a really long time to have science figure that out, you know. <laughs> science just didn't figure, what do you mean he hung it on nothing? That's ridiculous. Who's really the backward ones? <laughs> Man trying to understand by his own wisdom is the backward one. God had it from the beginning and explained it clearly exactly the way it was. Six days and it hangs on nothing. It's amazing. God was right again, huh? <laughs> it's amazing. And so death then cannot be harmonized with life either. Because the theory is, is that this needs to happen, that evil is necessary, that death is required in order for the next generation to eat and grow and come on. Revelation 21 verse 4 tells us that God's going to recreate this earth without all of that. That evil is not necessary, that it's not going to continue, that He has all of this in His hand. God has it all. And indeed, we cannot harmonize this idea of a Creator God in Genesis with long eons of time to make things happen. A Creator who's, who's bound up by the laws of nature and, oh no, I can't do that. That can't happen again for another million. Please. That's not our God. Our God is intensely involved, isn't He? And everything will not continue. Peter said, it, we're saying it continues as it always has. No. God is telling us He's going to break in. Jude verses 14 and 15 say, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh. Is Jesus coming soon? Amen. Come on now, Adventists. <laughs> Is Jesus coming soon? Amen. Yes, absolutely. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of His saints to do what? To execute judgment upon all. God is going to break into human history again, isn't He? God is going to make a difference. This will not continue as it always has. God is going to make a big difference here. We can't harmonize these things. And so, we by faith accept the Sabbath as the memorial that God can and indeed did create in just six literal days as His Word tells us, yes? Without stretching it out into millions of years. And so there's no need to harmonize this thing with some evolutionary theory. We don't need to do that. The Sabbath is our link isn't that true, Seventh Day Adventists? The Sabbath is our link to creation. Each week, we follow this book. We come here, we worship the Creator God. That's a fundamental belief of Seventh Day Adventists, yes? That's why we are who we are. But there's more to the story than just that. 
You see, we don't rest just on the historical facts of God creating and God creating a Sabbath and then looking forward to the second coming when he breaks in. There's more to this. There's more to this that affects us right now. Right now. The Sabbath is our link to our meaning as Seventh-day Adventists in this world at this time as a church today. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Perhaps you've been in this chapter once or twice. <laughs> Revelation chapter 14. There's an angel in verse 6, isn't there? You with me? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, having what? What's, what's another phrase that describes gospel? Good news. Good news. We want to be preaching the good news. Did Jesus die for our sins? Did Jesus come to this earth for us? Did Jesus keep the Sabbath while he was here? Mm -mm. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And what did he say as part of this gospel message? Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Why should we give glory to him if it was just natural occurrences that created this world? Why should we give glory to God if it's just the same old, same old that's been happening for millions of years? Brothers and sisters, our message as Seventh-day Adventists strikes directly against the evolutionary theory. We give glory to God because He is the Creator God, specifically. Otherwise, there's no point if it's just natural laws that just have been happening all because they just naturally do. There's no point in giving God any glory. He didn't do anything special. In fact, his hands were tied if the evolutionary theory is correct and they couldn't do anything. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell in the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Why? For the hour of His judgment is come. Our message is forward-looking that we are people who are warning this world of God who broke in who created back then, is going to break in again. This is a judgment, our message. This creator God also has the power to break in to his creation. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. Do what? Worship him. Why? He is the one who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. This message points directly to who we are as a people. We are a people giving the three angels message. Yes, that's who we are. This idea of the creator God is more than just, oh, yeah, I heard that before. I know about that. This is who we are. We are seventh day because of the Creator God. We are Adventist because He's breaking back in. He's coming again. This is who we are. But there's more to it. There's more to it. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, oh, what did she do? Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. There's others 
who would like to mix things up, who would like to change what the scriptures say, who would like to have us believe that there is no creator God who created in six literal days, who just, you know, works with nature and things and lets it roll. And he has no control. But that's not the God I know of. There's a message going around our world that we can compromise a little bit on what this says. But that's not our message. Our message is that Babylon is fallen. That this mixing of things is not what God says. That's not our message. Indeed, our voice becomes even clearer with verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Wow. The mark of the beast. And we've studied here what that mark is. And we know then what is God's seal. And it's what we've talked about here. That we keep the Sabbath. We can't compromise on these things. We have to go where God is leading us. We have to deliver the messages that God is asking us to deliver. We have to be Seventh-day Adventist. That's who we are. That's what this is all about. We want to go back to remembering who we are and then looking forward to know who we should be, what we should be about. We need to be about our Father's business, delivering the messages that God has given us to give to this dying world. Hmm. But praise God, there is a promise. I know how this story ends. I've read the end of the book, and I know how it ends. Take a look with me at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We have a promise to look forward to. Revelation 21 and beginning with verse 4. Are you with me? And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be what? What? No more what? No more death. Brothers and sisters, death is not life. Death is not necessary for life. Death is not required that life continue. We don't have to kill things to continue to live. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things. What? New. Do we have a creator God, one who is able to make all things new? It's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it beautiful what God can do and what He's done and what He's going to do? It is amazing. Now is not the time to throw away our confidence in the Word of God because there's so much evidence for evolution. Now is the time for the three angels' message. God is inviting us to give this message to the world, to tell people of a soon coming Savior, one who loves us enough that he's not willing for this seemingly endless cycle of life and death to continue, but he's going to break in. 
That's beautiful news, isn't it? In fact, that's good news. That's the gospel, the message that we're to preach. Jesus is coming again. And so, as we look at fundamental belief number six, which you find on your paper there, we find that it tells us indeed who we are. We are Seventh-day Adventists. I invite you this week to live who you are, to live as Seventh-day Adventists.